Okay. Well, I think just to situate it, it, it was when China and India had rejected the demands of the Queen of England acting as the empress of the global empire, uh, when she demanded openly, see this is the other thing I think to realize where we're at right now, they, the, the British Empire, the, the, the f various forces of it, are now having to come out openly in, uh, behind their policy. And when the Queen announced that she demanded of her uh, colonies that they accept the global warming hoax the, the, uh, uh, at the Copenhagen summit, when China and India came together and said, no, we're not going along with this suicide pact, effectively, that was when you had the, be the beginning of the build-up for war. We saw it first in Libya, the illegal invasion of or the, the illegal war in Libya, and now what we're seeing towards Syria and Iran. And so, so I think just to keep that in mind, that this is the, the targets of this are the nations of China, India, others of Asia, and obviously Russia in terms of a strategic partnership. And I think what we've gone through today so far is a look at what this, not just simply the future, but also what has been the better side of the history between the United States and Russia, between the United States and China. That that's actually the real heritage and the real history is this uh, actual mutual benefit concept, this Treaty of Westphalia concept. So uh, next, I'd like to, we're going to hear from Victor Chang. He will be speaking on behalf of the Institute of Sino-Strategic Studies. This is a uh, private U.S. organization and largely of U.S. scholars. And, uh, and I think the, Victor has a sense, you just dropped something there, Victor, I don't know if you need that, but uh, a sense of some of this historical relationship, and I think that, that, is, that uh, those concepts are embodied in Lyndon LaRouche, his wife Helga, and others that uh, have been working with us over the, the years, and we're glad to have Victor as a, a friend and ally in the fight. So. Thank you. The title of my presentation is the United States and China, Natural Allies for the Justice, Peace, and Prosperity of the World. I would like to thank previous speakers, especially Mike, who make my job much easier. <laughs> I think this is an advantage of being a late speaker. <laughs> you don't have to really worry about you might really go beyond your allowed time. The world is entering a critical transitional and a defining moment as the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis has painfully demonstrated. The political and economic systems which have been dominated by financial oligarchs over the last several hundred years have failed all peoples around the world and need to be changed. Therefore, I am pleased and honored to be invited to this important conference, the Second American Revolution and the New Paradigm for Mankind sponsored by the EIR and the Schiller Institute. And time and again, Schiller's dramas demonstrate how a person's duty lies above his or her own personal inclinations. How he and she must be both a patriot and a world citizen. For the true interest of any one nation 
can never be at odds with the interests of the whole world. It is in this spirit that his teaching is so relevant to our attempt to establish a new paradigm. Any rational person would agree that to overcome the ongoing financial and economic crisis requires constructive partnerships among countries and the people in this global village. However, the world has become even more unstable after the financial crisis. Political upheavals have spread to every continent from Africa to America. Why? It's because of increasing polarization of wealth distribution among countries and among citizens in individual countries. Tensions even flared in East Asia, a relatively calm region before 2008. Part of the reason is the highly vocal announcement of rebalancing of the U.S. military forces, 6% of which will be deployed in Asia. As an American orig originally from the region, I totally agree that Asia is of great importance to the future well-being of this country. However, is destabilizing the region really serving, serving the interest of this country, serving the interest of Asian countries, and serving the interest of the whole world? Of course, of course, the answer to most rational people is a resounding no. So, why did our policy makers do this? As pointed out by Lynn Helga and many scholars here, the source of this trouble is the financial oligarchs who have betrayed the U.S. Constitution and have gradually taken control of the U.S. politics since 1913, when the Federal Reserve was established. In this speech, I will mainly focus on why the U.S. and China are natural allies and how can we strengthen this strategic relationship. The U.S.-China relation is unprecedented in the history of the nations. The United States is attempting to work with a rising power to foster its rise as an active contributor to global security, stability, and prosperity, while also sustaining and securing American leadership in a changing world. Two countries are together building a model in which both countries strike a stable and a mutually acceptable balance between cooperation and competition. And this is uncharted territory. And uh, we have to get it right. Otherwise, we will face a great disaster. There are many differences between the two political and economic systems, two cultural and historical experiences. One of them is the US trade deficit of $300 billion per year with China, which need to be addressed in a constructive manner, not in a really accusing each other's manner. Now, however, there are many converging interests between the US and China. Ne uh, let me name a few. Both countries need a peaceful and a stable international environment. 
both countries have become sorely inescapably interdependent. Both countries, or at least the, the, most of people in both countries, are committed to building a cooperative partnership based on mutual benefit and mutual respect. And both are looking for a win-win relationship instead of zero-sum game. Both countries are facing increasing polarization of wealth distribution in their respective societies. The citizens of this country need to take back our government from the hands of financial oligarchs. And the Chinese need to get rid of crony capitalism. There are also many similarities between the two countries. Their size is uncannily close, with both occupying almost exactly 6.5% of the, the, world's, the world's land mass. And both are mutual, both are multinational states. And the both are religiously tolerant countries. Contrary to many smear campaigns against China, again, if you look at Chinese history, the one thing stands out there is in its more than 4,000 years of history, there was no religious war. And uh, even communist China in the recent years uh, actually very tolerant against the different religions. As long as the religious groups are not to use religion as a cover to engage in subversion and certain or illegal activities. Most importantly, Chinese and Americans share the same deepest beliefs and desires in our heart and the soul as shown by the similarities between the teachings of American founding fathers and those teachings of ancient Chinese philosophers and the Chinese leader of modern times. It is in this sense that the US and China are mutual allies. So therefore, I shall discuss these shared values in the remaining of my presentation. The funding principle of the U.S. is best expressed by the preamble to the United States. And the basic ideas are pro to promote a general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And uh, the, our government, as envisioned by our founding fathers, is a government of the people, by the people, for the people, as eloquently expressed by Lincoln in his famous Gettysburg Address. And this idea has greatly influenced many Chinese leaders of modern times such as Dr. Sun Yixian and the uh, late President Chiang Kai-shek, Mao Zedong, Chou Enlai, Deng Xiaoping, and Jiang Zemin, etc. And the Lini is an expert on this subject. Now, this people first principle is also the deepest belief in Chinese heart and the soul, as reflected in the teachings of ancient Chinese scholars. And may I have next slide, please? And the, the most important concept of Confucius and ancient Chinese philosophy can be expressed in several simple characters. As the slide shown here, the one of the very important core concept is the character Zen, you know, which was broadly translated as benevolence, 
But actually, its meaning is much deeper and richer than benevolence. This character consists of two parts. The left part looks like a human, like, you know, then, okay, people, person. The, the right part, I think you can all figure out, two, right? So that means two persons is basically dealing with how to define, how to relate from person to person. In other words, it's a, to, it's a proper way to treat one another. Put it in a more concrete term, is to love, which means I, love. To love your friends, to love the people around you. And another, the, furthermore, Confucius taught us that this is the ethic of reciprocity. So, ji so bu yu, wu si yu ren means one should not treat others in ways that one would not like to be treated. It's kind of a negative form of golden rule. And in the Western culture, most took the positive form of golden rule, which means do unto others as you would have others do unto you. This is slightly different, which has a profound effect on the thinking of a two cultures, of two people. Now, the second, uh, next few important concept, one is, next slide, please, is a very important one called E. means that you sacrifice yourself for the great good of the society, of the whole, of the whole world. And uh, this character consists of two Two parts. The first one is yang, is, is a sheep. Now, sheep was a, a sacrifice in ancient time. And the sacrifice for what? For the, you know, for the better, for the greater good of the, your group. And uh, the second character is war, means me or I. In other words, you are willing to act as, as a sheep, as a sheep for the great part of the society. So this is a very important concept. In the other one is a harmony called He. Harmony, in other words, you want to seek harmony in music, in whatever, in many things, and to try to, you try to avoid going dreams. And uh, the other one, the character is the Ping, means equality, equal opportunity. So if you combine two words, he and the ping, the last two words, it, it's translated in English as a peace. In other words, peace, a uh, 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 lasting peace, can only be built upon on harmony and uh, equality. So that's the, now the next slide. Okay, and uh, this is, uh, this slide shows, is, no, unfortunately it's only, can we shrink the, the, the image? Oh, okay, fine, don't worry. Okay, I want to show you the beautiful, uh, be you know, uh, beautiful calligraphy, okay? This calligraphy is of a, a model treasured by generations of Chinese classical scholars. And I'm going to explain the meaning of this model. Next slide, please. Okay, this model consists of four parts. In Mandarin, says, We tian di li xing, we sheng ming li ming, we wang sheng ji jue xue, we wan si kai tai ping. What does this mean? The first one is to ordain. <laughs> Therefore, I, I take the, the liberty to make this translation. Okay. The first part, to ordain conscience for heaven and earth. But what the heck does this mean, right? Okay, according to Chinese philosophy, nature's rules is called, the, natural, the, the, the way of nature is called a Tao. Probably, I know people probably have heard of that. And uh, so this, this, the, the, the first part of this thing is, is really, as a scholars, you need to harness the way of nature, okay? And in order to bring the benefit to all the people, 
and the world. For example, you observe nature, you know, the sun's motion around, you know, the weather change, etc., etc. You, what purpose you want to harness the ways of nature for the benefits of the people? The second one is to secure life and the fortune for the people. That means it's a greater love, the eye. The third one is to continue the finest teachings of ancient sages, Confucius, Manfucius, and the others. And for what purpose? It's last and last part. To establish peace for all future generations. So that uh, is the most important model for Chinese tradition scholars. In my view, this model is, pretty, is very consistent with the teaching of our founding fathers, with the teachings of Schiller. And this is why I believe that both people share the, 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 deepest, the deepest the beliefs. Now, so next slide, please. So what can we do in a more practical sense? And next slide. Okay, wait a minute, there's another one. Oh, no, no, the one before. The one before. Oh, no, okay. Oh, fine. Okay, good. That, that's all right. I mean, that's, all right. So what can we do? We should uh, take the, the idea as expressed by Lin and uh, Lin, no, the no, new group. We should promote co cooperation instead of what? Confrontation. And we should build our cooperation, cooperation based on science, technology, and uh, development. And uh, take the uh, Far East Asia as an example. There are many tensions over there. Tension between Russia, uh, Russia and Japan, Japan and China, between North Korea and South Korea, and et cetera, et cetera. However, if a, a, a rational people look at all the, the needs of all the regions, there really not, there's no really fundamental conflicts. There are mutual needs and the needs for further development. And uh, as mentioned early in the early you know, speech speakers, the, we should expand the Nawapa to include and, uh, and extend the Eurasian bridge to the to US, to American continent. And uh, we need to develop the vast land of Siberia, Korea, China, etc. It's based on this development, we can form a new bond, a new spirit. Another thing area is in the space explorations. Just several days ago, three astronauts who completed China's longest manned space mission returned to China to Earth safely, making another giant step forward towards the country's goal of building a permanent manned space station by the year of 2020. U.S. and Russia were one of the pioneer countries in space development. However, in recent years in U.S., this effort has become much more reduced. I think that the future of the mankind, the opportunity, more, a lot of opportunities are in the space. And maybe our challenge, a threat, one day may come from the space also. And I think in this financially difficult period, we should pull our resources together to jointly engage in the space exploration program. And I, I think all those things will help, but the most important is to build a uh, cooperate environment. Next slide, please. This slide is my, la my last slide. Okay. And this slide shows Ideal world as envisioned by Confucius and by ancient Chinese philosophers. It's called Chinese dream. And the dream is what? To build a, 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 a 世界大同. 
build, to build a, a world of great harmony and equality, and to build a world of Tian Xia Wei Gong. In other words, the society belongs to everybody. That is consistent with general welfare, as stated in the preamble to the United States. The Chinese the dream, which is neither communist nor non-communist in character, but simply Chinese, represents the spirit of development and the progress, not just for China, but for the, the whole world. I hope this, this will also be the dream of all the people in the whole world. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>